recently read about you in the press, and I, I felt, you know, one of the million reasons why we're kindred spirits, I related to this quote of, I'm not aggressive, I'm passionate, which I think a lot of people who have worked with me can understand. I have a very strong point of view on a lot of things. Um, but I also appreciated what came after that, and that was, you're sick of having the conversation around diversity and inclusion, because you want to see people doing it, getting to work. Um, what does that look like for you? So again, when, 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 I, when I say that I am <coughs> frustrated or not, uh, uh, is that the playbook has been written. Right. Particularly in our in industry, the playbook exists, which is if you have clients that represent the communities that they serve, these are the people that write the brief for an advertising campaign, then you have on the agency side, teams that are representative of the communities that they serve, and they actually create the concept. Then you have people in the production house that represent the communities that they serve. They actually bring that particular idea to life. The output, the creative output, is going to be superior and it's going to have a bigger impact in the business. And I've been able now for several years to prove it consistently. When you make the changes on the client side, you force the agency that are working on your account to move in that direction. You create incentives for people to hire um, production professionals. The scores are going to be there and the correlation between effectiveness scores and, build, and, and business creation is it, 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 positive. So representation is, 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 is clearly important ensuring that there is a pipeline of diverse talent across the totality of the ecosystem is important. The tools are there. There's um, different organizations that have created truly uh, uh, internships as well as mentoring programs that we should be able to level, um, um, leverage more broadly. And then we do need, That's the. I think that that's to me the next frontier, which is we need to, to deal with the microaggression mm -hmm. more directly, being more forceful about it, uh, calling it. We need to call it uh, when it when it's happening to create that level of openness and conversations that the corporations need to have when it comes to women and also the people of color. Yeah. That to me is paramount. Yeah, it's great. Um, so I want to flip the script for a little bit because we've been talking a lot about the issues, but now I really want to take a minute as a woman myself um, and someone who mentors a lot of women on a day-to-day -day basis and we have a lot of amazing students in this room that are getting ready to go on to the next frontier and find new jobs. And what I hear time and time again from a lot of these um, female students is, you know, this idea of the imposter syndrome of, you know, I don't know if I'm good enough for this job, or I don't know, you know, do I don't have the right experience? You know, I come from the school of fake it till you make it. So <laughs> I'm like, take ownership of the things you've done and tell people how you can convert that and translate that into the job you're going to do. Um, but some people have, you know, a hard time um, presenting themselves in a way that's, you know, getting them ready for the right job. So how, what advice do you have for women out there who struggle with this idea of positioning themselves for the big jobs? Um, I think three, three, three things. Number one is raise your, raise your hand and believe in your potential as opposed to your capability. And that's the fundamental difference. And again, there's study after study after study that prove that. Men are promoted on potential, women are in capability. Most of the times, I, most of the women that I mentor have this issue. I am not, I, I don't think I'm ready for this particular job because I like this and this and this and that. And I said, yes, but you have this and this and this and that. And the other stuff you're gonna be able to learn. So they're raising your hand and, and, and betting you on your own potential is critically important. Number two, networking is not fun or optional. Net networking is part of the deal, period. Anyone that gets a big job needs to have advocates, needs to have allies, taking time to have a cup of coffee, taking time to have a sandwich, taking time to call a 30-minute meeting, 
with people that are going to be important in, in your career, you have to take it as part of the job, as an additional task of all the other stuff that, and in fact, it is so important that you should be ruthless about establishing the right level of priorities, but networking is critically important in the development of your career. And most of the women that I mentor truly understand, I don't have time for it. I don't have time for, for coffee, I don't have time for lunch, I have other stuff to do, I have my kids, which I totally understand. But when we've gone through those conversations and we've gone to the detail, most of the time I've been able to identify meetings that could be eliminated so that the networking, networking is a critical business function. It's as simple as that. And the third piece, learn to present really, really well. Presentations are not politics. Presentations are the way that an organization is able to trust individuals with money and results so that the, the job can get done. If you don't have good presentation skills, your project is not going to get done, the people in your team are not going to be rewarded, and you're not going to be able to get promoted. Presentation skills is like networking, is the ability to communicate effectively what you want to do. And that to me is really, really, really very important. Those three things that I consistently, uh, consistently tell um, the, the, the people that I mentor and, and with special emphasis for group. That's great. I could sit here and actually talk to you for the next few months. <laughs> I don't want to let you go. It's okay. Don't go to San Francisco. <laughs> But um, I think there's probably a lot of questions out there, so I don't want to suck all the air time, and I want to give an opportunity for you guys to ask some of the burning questions that you have on your mind. So, um, what do you got for Antonio? The floor is yours. Uh, one of the things that I've been hearing a lot lately, and from your speech as well, is expectations, and kind of level setting expectations by inviting conversations. And I'm wondering if you could just share a few examples of how you invite a level setting expectation. When you say the level setting expectations, you mean what? I'm sorry. I just um, want to make sure that I address your... So, uh, for instance, with your daughter, you're, you're saying, would you like me to com comment or to listen? So, so your expectation is, I'm not sure what I should do, what should I do? And then she level sets the expectation by saying, this is what I want you to do. So it's like, I don't know if we're all so skilled at inviting a level setting, like here's my expectation, what's yours? Like sometimes it feels scary or awkward or um, unprofessional and I'd like it to become a more consistent part of my daily conversations. So I'm wondering if you could just give some examples of how you do it or what you say. Okay, so um, a couple of thoughts. Um, first, career development, and I firmly believe in this, is a two-way street of which the most important part is the side that you're driving, as opposed to what the corporation is driving. Next, your boss or the people that are responsible for your future are not going to know what you want unless you actually tell them. Because it's like, okay, uh, my friend here, she was great in media. If we would have never had a conversation that she wanted to transcend the media world, and I have her and 15 other people to deal with, as a boss, I'm going to box her in the media world. And like that, you can add whatever you want. It's really very important that you set your expectations with the people that you're, you're working. If you don't do it, no one is gonna do it for you, and, and a story will be created about you why? Because companies do it all the time. Oh, Antonio Hispanic, and blah, 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 he will probably like to work on multicultural. I mean, we, we, all have, we all have those, we all do it all the time. Why? Because life is, is complex, because we have not one, I have 11 direct reports, and in addition to that, we all have, the only way that I'm going to know what you want, what you need, is if we can have a, a, an honest conversation about it. Third point, guys do it all the time. They're not shy about saying, I want this, I need this, I, my life would be better if I was doing that. They don't think it's unprofessional, they think they're entitled to do it. 
women feel significantly more, more awkward about it, and sometimes I have to invite. And it's cultural, you know, in meetings, women tend to be a bit more quiet, you need the boss, you might get it. I never had to do it with, with her. <laughs> but sometimes I have to go, okay, every, I, I, I listen to everybody, what do you think? And wonderful words of wisdom will come out of there. So all, all that is true, but, um, uh, and we need to change that. But be a strong self-advocate is a very important thing. The worst thing that you want, the worst thing that you can do is to have someone interpreting what you want to do and your career ending up in a corner that you never imagined. And again, bosses are people too. They don't know what they don't know. The more that you can share what you need and want, and be ready for an open and candid conversation, by the way. Guys do that too, which is sometimes, is, I'm sorry, what you're talking about? No way. And, and the guy will say, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> I can do that. Uh, and then we can level set. Actually, you cannot do that here, example, 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 example. <laughs> so it, it's like, be ready to be a self-advocate. Self be ready to take the feedback, because once you invite it, you, you have to take it, and be ready to make the adjustments necessary if what you want requires a different behavior that you, you currently have. But own it. Own, don't ex the world is not going to move you in the ways that you want to move, because the world doesn't know what you want to do. Sometimes you yourself don't even know what you want to do. <laughs> so having those honest and open conversations are, are, are critically important, and for the most part, um, bosses welcome that. It helps, it helps me incredibly when I know what people really want to do. By this stage in my life, I ask. But there were times where I didn't ask. Um, anyway, that's it. Hopefully that helps. Hi, my name is, oh, it's kind of loud. My name is Kinsey Hunt, and I am a student at LMU. Thank you so much for joining us today. My question is, how do you communicate, or what are techniques that you can use to communicate your passion without coming off aggressively? Without being perceived as aggressive? Yeah. I mean, I think we need to change that. <laughs> I think, I, I think, you're, you, I think you don't have the problem. I think the rest of the world has a problem. I, I honestly don't, I, I yeah. And it's sad, uh, and again, in, 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 in all honesty, and I've said this many times, I don't think that I would be sitting here in front of you with my current job if uh, I would have developed my career in the U.S. domestic division. I developed my career in international. We did have a gender problem. Most of us were men at the time, back in the 80s. Um, but from a diversity standpoint, we were from different races, different religions, we all had accents, especially the Americans. And some of us were loud, some of us were shy, some of us would stare at people in the eye as a sign of trust and, and respect. Some of us actually didn't because it was a sign of respect. Um, so, I've always been loud, I've always been aggressive, I've always been loud, I've always spoken with my hands, and, 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 and I was part of uh, the amazing, by the way, Jonathan Mindenhall, the ex-CMO uh, of Airbnb, who also developed himself, uh, he's, he's a British black gay man, um, uh, also developed himself in the international division, um, uh, uh, in, the, in the domestic division, in the U.S., I would have been, I mean, you know, I was Latin, I came from a state university, as opposed to all the other people that I, that not work for me. Um, <laughs> uh, it, 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 I was just very different, and people don't want, uh, it's not, um, I, I, these are not bad people, uh, they're my friends. It's just like, it's significantly easier for you to communicate with people like yourself. It's easier for me to communicate with Latins too. By the way, it's just part of, part, of, part of life, but we need to, on this particular case that you're mentioning, that's my campaign for, this, for the next couple of years, calling it. And this whole notion of 
the, the, the aggressiveness is very different than passion. Um, passion is a very good thing. We should encourage this as opposed to uh, tone it down. And that we need to understand that um, it is consistent. This is not just uh, not just on, on Facebook or previously in, 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 in HP or Visa or the companies that I work. It is across industries, across places. Consistently, people of color are called aggressive. That you can't. We can all. We can all be aggressive. Of course, they're aggressive of us. Like they're aggressive white people. Um, it, it, it's it's um, that is something that we're going to need to deal with. My advice, what I'm telling people is, when it comes to the time where that is happening at the performance appraisal, you have to call it. I'm sorry you were not understanding me again, talking about what we just said, taking control about yourself. I don't agree with that assessment. I do not agree with that assessment. I begin to have the conversation uh, that way. We will work on the top end by calling it and creating all these types of, but at the personal end, which is the most important and more helpful part to you, own it and call it. Graduated LMU MBA in '86, so about a year. <laughs> Same age. It was a different world, and when I was there, very. it very different. And so, thank you so much for being someone very close to my age who has changed. And because it used to be, I mean, we were women were many men, and we even wore the bow ties, and you know, we were and. We all felt like the women, okay, I can only get ahead if another woman doesn't, because there's only room for one at the top. So thank you so much for being so enlightened. And how did you become that way? Because a lot of men of that age don't change. They just, this is the way it is, so. So, again, there are internal and external factors. Um, I mean, internally is what I said, you know, I have a family, I had the privilege, honestly, I do believe that I had the privilege to work for women. The moment that even if you're from the old world and you begin to work for women and you begin to see her in all, in all, all their splendors as the amazing professionals that they are, regardless of gender, and then things begin to move in your, in your head, uh, in your, in your head uh, quite a bit. The other piece, which is the part that I honestly am beginning to have fundamental problems with, the business case, my God. It's just, it's 50% of the population is 80% 80, 80 of the purchase decisions. It's just not having that point of view as a marketer is just wrong. Um, I, I, I have to say that as a discipline, our, 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 I, just, I was just reviewing some numbers uh, from the ANA yesterday. For the very first time, we have 50%, 47. 47% um, of CMOs are female. 51% of top marketing executives in the disciplines are females. And the reason for that is what I just said. The consumer is female. It's not that the future is female, it's the present is female. Um, unfortunately, I was going back to the, the on the agency side, that's not the case. We still have less than 30% of creative directors, the ones that write the commercials, that are female. And then on the director's side, it's even less than 20%. So it's even, even more. So uh, there are, again, propensity to change is one. The business case and the external is, uh, is, uh, is another one. I, I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> we probably have time for one more question, Sam. Oh. Two more questions. Okay. So we'll start there. Start there. Let's 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 start
So I definitely agree with the under representation of women, but uh, there's also another dynamic to that one, and it is the multi-generational workplace that we deal with. Uh, just yesterday I was listening to the radio and it was millennials versus baby boomers. Mm -hmm. And I was just wanting to get your thoughts on how can we leverage the benefits of having millennials and baby boomers in the industry, in the companies, and just being better with everybody. Okay, so that's a great, um, great. Um, I, I uh, again, I'm, <laughs> I well, became, I, mean. I became like the poster child of diversity now against ageism. Uh, my boss is 35. Uh, so that um, talk about millennials and uh, and boomers. Um, I, I, I think the, the principles have to be the same and consistent, which is we should have organizations that represent the communities that we serve. Um, and there has to be a business case. Fundamentally, we can talk about young people all we want because they set trends and all that. When it comes to consumption, the consumption is on the poor side. Mm -hmm. It's just numbers. Um, and, 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 and therefore, I think that there is, it is a disservice to any of the industries not to have multi-generational um, uh, uh, situations, situations like that. In my particular case, one of the things, going back to your one of the things that, uh, to your questions, I am a firm believer on reverse mentoring. Um, ten years ago, when I decided to own um, social media, when I was not even expecting to end up in the, in the job that I have today, um, I remember going uh, going to uh, Twitter at the time, and uh, Melissa Barnes, that yeah. you, know, you know very well, and I said I need someone that um, teaches me how to deal with these new things because I, I cannot lead a team unless you actually become a, a practitioner. So uh, uh, Melissa and I became an amazing relationship. <coughs> it, was, it, it started, she was mentoring me as to how to use the platform and she was ruthless. Oh my God, I don't know what a bad tweet. <laughs> Awful tweet. You have, to be, you have to be in line with your strategy. Your profile is your strategy. Anything in that, I mean it was just, but it ended up being a, a, a relationship that was beneficial for both, for both of us. Because as she, as she began progressing throughout the organization, then my contributions to her were not leadership. It was about what am I going to do within the context of what, what, what should I do next? How do I move the organization to actually do this? How do I let people know what I really want? So I fundamentally believe that when we're at our best is when we have this multi-generational dynamics where we're learning from each other, and by the way, it is critically important as we convey the messages to the world, because yeah, the future is here, but the money is it's still with the boomers. Hi, yes, one more. So, hola Antonio, my name is Natalia Ruiz. I am the co-founder of Girls Lead Summit, All which right. is a peer-to-peer -peer mentorship program for girls, eight to 14 years old. And eight, I really eight to fourteen. Eight, eight to fourteen, correct. So I really love, you know, the big impact that women have had in your life through your daughters, through your granddaughters. So now my question is, how are you and your team implementing perhaps new initiatives to inspire kids to bring, you know, talking about the multi generational impact? How are you bringing in kids to actually be part of this new reality and allow them to become that inspiration for all of us as well? Okay, so the, 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 I'm going to be very candid, as I normally do. I'm glad that people like you and, and their organizations doing that, and I, I think it's it's incredibly important important job. The work that I can do at this stage of my life is about changing the C-suite dynamic. Because if those girls that you're training going up are not going to see women like Rochelle in the, in the big jobs, they are going to become incredibly demotivated. My job is about changing the top, being ruthless about changing the top. That's what I can do better than anyone else. And hopefully, by the time that your girls come up into the work into the workplace, there is a much better multi-color, multi-gender 
uh, playing field for them to thrive. So the job that you're doing is very complementary to mine. That's awesome. What a powerful note to end on. And it's been an amazing conversation with you. It's always um, fun to see you. I know, I know. We have to do this more often. By the way, none of the stuff that apply to women, gender issues apply to this woman over here. <laughs> she drives, she tells, she pushes, she achieves. You're a great role model. You're really a great role model. North, and we really appreciate that you being here today. And I just want to thank Darlene Fukuji, who is an amazing chair, master, board um, I want to take a moment to thank David Choi, Dr. David Choi, and the Kiesner Center for Entrepreneurship, and the Hilton at the, at the CBA, our College of Business. And I want to thank all of our sponsors that have been a part of the event as well to help provide the food and the drink and everything that's in your bags that you have here today because it's just, it's a team effort. Um, so I will send you guys off into a break. Um, I we think have a little have... thank you for oh. you before we go off. Thank you again. Uh, well, it's truly you. inspiring. Let's give it up for one more time. Thank you again for your time.